Good morning, and welcome to worship at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Ottawa, Ontario. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce to you our speaker this morning, the Reverend Terry Denbach. Good morning, and uh, I'm going to read from Psalms 95, verse 1 through 7. It's our call to worship this morning, but I want to let you know that I did bring with me a directory from Emmanuel Presbyterian Church, so I have your pictures in front of me. I know you're not here, but I want you to smile big and pretty this morning and uh, let people know that you're alive and well. Let's look at Psalms 95, verse 1 through 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And the hands and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. May the Lord add a blessing to his word this morning. Let's continue to worship this morning as Colin plays Take Up Your Cross. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Heavenly Father, it is so good to come and to pray and to spend time in your presence. And we ask this morning, Lord, that you would speak to hearts that are watching, Lord. Lord, that you would touch them, Lord, that you would bring strength, Lord, and comfort to their lives. Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, as the service goes on, Lord, that you would have be a part of every part of it, Lord. The music, the sermon, Lord. Lord, that you would speak out through it, Lord Jesus, to our hearts, for we are hungry. We need to hear you, Lord. So bless your people today. Lord, bless those, O oh God, who are, are not well this morning. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them, Lord, that you would touch them, Lord, and, and be, there, be that healing to them this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you, Lord, and we ask your blessing upon this service now. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me this morning? 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's worship with Colin again as he plays by faith. Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, Isaiah 50, verses 6 and 7. But first, I'd like to just uh, read a couple of things here before we begin. And would you bow your heads with me just for a moment as we pray? Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can come together, Lord, and share your word. Lord, I pray this morning that as your word goes forth, that it would touch our hearts, that it would bring life and peace during these dark times, Lord. So bless your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, I have you in front of me here, and it's nice to see Wayne and Marjorie and Carol and and uh, Ray and Lorna, and I'm going to get in trouble if I, don't, if I miss some people. So just so you know, you're here, and I'm looking at you. <laughs> what did Jesus go through leading up to the cross and to his crucifixion? The scriptures say he knew beforehand. He knew what would happen. And yet, he did it anyway. At the end of the service, I'm going to play a, we're going to play a song that's entitled, He Did It Anyway. You did it anyway. You walked right up that hill, and the sounds of sacrifice are ringing still. 
You knew the magnitude of the price you'd have to pay. But for me, you did it anyway. For the past few weeks, I've been thinking of these words as we draw closer to Easter, to Good Friday. I mentioned them in my last sermon a few weeks ago. He set his face like flint. These words come to us from Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6 and 7. I'd like to read it this morning. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Jesus set his face, or hardened it, not in the sense that he was angry, or mad, but in the sense of having focus. He was focused through a very difficult time that he was about to endure. It's important for us to realize and to understand and to remember that from the summer of 30 AD when he set his face like flint to the, to the spring of 31 AD when Jesus was crucified, that during that time, Jesus continued to minister. He continued to heal. He continued to teach. And he continued to provide for people like you and I, whom he loves. That's why he came. Well, on the way to the cross, Jesus touched people's lives. He heals a demon-possessed boy. Jesus saves a woman caught in the very act of adultery from being stoned. And he tells her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus heals a blind man with some spit and clay. Jesus sends out 70 into the towns before him. And their job was to go and to heal the sick and declare the kingdom of God has come. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He redeems Zacchaeus up in the tree. Zacchaeus finds the Lord. He blesses children. He heals lepers. Our Jesus. He knew what lied ahead of him, yet he reached out to us, to people like you and I. These words are spoken of our wonderful Savior who would suffer greatly for us, for you and for me. He, Jesus, would endure scorn and shame on our behalf. It was these words that Luke was writing of when he wrote the gospel, in his gospel. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely or steadfastly set out for Jerusalem. Luke 9 and 51. Or set his face to go to Jerusalem. Just days before Jesus had been encouraged in this purpose, in his purpose, and is in his fulfilling the cross, so now he sets his course. There's no hesitation, no second thoughts, no uncertainty. He went to accomplish his death at Jerusalem for you and for I. Just days before, well, let me read from Luke 9, verse 28 through 31. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. Then behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, of his death, which was about to, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Verse 31, Jesus regarded his approaching death, <coughs> excuse me, not as something that would happen to him, but he approached it in these terms. His approaching death was something he would accomplish. Huh. That changes everything. It changes everything. This same word accomplish is often translated in the Bible as something 
he would fulfill or something he would complete. You see, it was the Father's will that Christ die in our place. John 3, 16 and 17, you know it well. Maybe you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. We need to hear that this morning. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, the world through him might be saved. What does being saved mean? The word salvation in the Bible, it comes from a Greek word that's meaning sodzo. It means to protect, to preserve, to heal, to deliver, to become whole or to keep safe. How's that this morning? That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. We are redeemed and protected and preserved and healed and delivered. We are made whole and we are kept safe through salvation. Sadzo in the King James Version is translated 93 times as save. 12 times it's translated to become whole. I thought of Judge Judy. You maybe watch Judge Judy. And she often says she's come, her part of her, her task as a judge is to make the offended person whole, to bring back to them that which was taken. That's what Christ came to do for us. He came to make us whole. Twelve times to become whole. Four times to heal. Once to do well and once to preserve. We often use the word saved to describe a point in time. I hope you can remember yours. When we become a child of God. But God's word uses the Greek word sodzo to describe the whole realm of benefits we receive. Past, present, and future. From the moment we become a child of God, we are being saved. The future tense of salvation is when our salvation is completed at the rapture of the church. As Romans 8 and 23 says, let me read it. For, and I'm going to read verse 22 also. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. And not only they, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The rapture is going to take place, church. It's going to take place. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise be to God. So it is, it was the Father's will for his Son to suffer and die for the sins of mankind. Jesus knew what would take place. And here's the amazing thing. He set his face like flint, and he went. He did it anyway. Let me say that again. My God knew exactly what you and I were going to cost him, his very life. He knew that it was going to be hard. He knew that it was going to be dirty. He knew that it was going to be very painful. Yet Jesus followed the road marked out for him towards Jerusalem. 1 Peter chapter 2. The first part of verse 24 says, He himself. Now that's an important statement. He didn't send a servant. He didn't send an angel. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So determined to follow God's plan. So you and I, whosoever will, may be forgiven that Jesus set his face like flint. Those words spoken of in Isaiah have a story to tell us. The word flint was chosen. Flint's a very hard type of sedimentary rock. When you strike it against steel, it produces a spark, often used to start, to start campfires and so on. Setting your face like a flint 
was chosen to describe that God knew exactly what was going to take place. He knew exactly what was going to happen. It implies that you and I are expecting problems, trouble, some opposition, and that you would stand strong in the midst of adversity, that what you had set out to accomplish would indeed be accomplished. The words that Jesus set his face like a flint, like flint meant he knew there would be trouble, <laughs> but that he knew he would be victorious for you and for me and for all who would receive him. To set your face like flint means to regard these difficulties and all of the trouble that you would endure as worthwhile. Can you imagine? As worthwhile when you consider all that would be accomplished, all that would be won, and all that it would lead to. Sadzo, our salvation, that we would be protected and preserved and healed and delivered and made whole and kept safe. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. Hallelujah. Here's the truth. Jesus Christ took our sins in his own body on the cross. Apostle Peter clearly states it in 1 Peter 2 and 21. Christ suffered for you. What he meant was Christ bore our sins in his own body on the cross. Peter meant that in this doctrinal language was this. The sin of Adam was first imputed or passed to all of his descendants. Well, that's me and that's you this morning. In other words, it, was, it is reckoned as theirs and they are dealt with as guilty. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because God so loved the world, the righteousness of Christ is imputed or passed to everyone who believes in him. Christ is the answer or is attributed to them and our sins are attributed to Christ. He assumed our low place. He assumed our guilt. Though in him was found no sin, he took my sin. He, Jesus, undertook to answer the demands of justice for our sins. Jesus Christ, hallelujah, bore our sins in his own body on the cross. But that's not all. Jesus did it. He went to the cross for you and for me. Now God's aim in this guilt-lifting death of Jesus on the cross was and is this. The last part of verse 24. That we might die to sin and that we might now live in righteousness. Live for the glory of God in this life, in this world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me read this. When the word of the cross breaks into our heart by the power of God's spirit and we awaken to the fact that God loves us so much that he takes the life of his own son in order to bring us under his shepherd care, under his shepherd protection, his shepherd provision, his shepherd guidance. At that moment, we die to the lie of sin. We die to the power of sin's deceit, which tries to persuade us that a better future can be had through sin than through righteousness. The cross convinces us in the depth of our heart that God is committed to us like a mighty shepherd. That sounds good to me. And when God through Christ at the cross reveals that power in us, we die to sin and we awaken to the beauty of righteousness in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to share a story with you that happened while I was here several years ago as an intern pastor. One of your members was dying from cancer and they passed away. 
But before they passed away, I had the great opportunity and privilege to visit with them. In one of these visits in the hospital while waiting, they were waiting to go to Barry for some tests. They told me that they had done it all in church. They had been an usher and an elder and, and a bus driver and, a, and a, a Sunday school teacher. They had done it all, but they sure they weren't sure that when they died, they would go to heaven. Well, we fixed that right there. We stood in that hospital room, arm in arm, and we prayed that Jesus Christ would come into his heart, into his life, would forgive him of all of his sin, and would come and make his home in his heart. Right there we prayed that the victory of Christ, that Christ won at the cross, would be theirs. That the power of sin would die and he would be made alive in the beauty of Christ's righteousness. We finished praying and the orderlies were there and they whisked him away to Barry for some more tests. I came back the next day and they were still in a, in a, a room in the, in the emergency room. But <laughs> something had changed. Even though they had received bad news while in Barry, he was rejoicing. He was so alive. The promises of God were alive in him. He knew Jesus was living in his heart, and eternal life was his. And he rejoiced, and we rejoiced together, and he rejoiced some more, and we rejoiced together some more. Hallelujah. A few days later, Pastor Heather and an elder came to visit him and serve communion while in the hospital. She said to me, when she had come back, she said that she walked into the room and it was like the sun was beating down on him. She said it was so radiant. He was so alive. <sighs> Hallelujah. It was like the sun was shining on him. He was radiant with the love of God. How about you? Do you know him this morning? You can. Would you receive him today? Would you pray with me? Let's pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray slowly and you can repeat. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for me and that you rose again. I invite you to come into my heart and into my life. I will trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, tell somebody. Call someone up. Let others know so they can support you and pray with you. I have a song I mentioned earlier. I want to play it for you this morning. It's entitled, You Did It Anyway. Let's listen. As the angels watched you kneel, you are and knew just how the cross would feel, how deep the spear would go, how sharp the thorns would be, and that your father would forsake you in your agony. But you, you did. sounds of sacrifice are ringing still. You knew the magnitude of the price you'd have to pay. 
but for me you did it anyway you knew your closest friends would turn their backs on you and leave you all alone to do what only you could do but among the saddest things that caused your heart to grieve was knowing there were those who never would believe Sacrifice are ringing still. You knew the magnitude of the price you'd have to pay. And the sounds of sacrifice, they're ringing still. You knew the magnitude of the price you have to pay. But for me, you did it anyway. You did it anyway. I'd like to uh, add, in closing the sermon this morning, uh, a uh, paragraph from Charles Spurgeon. He says, O oh, you redeemed ones, on whose behalf this strong resolve was made, you who have been bought by the precious blood of this steadfast, resolute Redeemer, Come and think a while of him, that your hearts may burn within you, and that your faces may be set like flints to live and die for him who lived and died for you. May God bless his word as it goes forth this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we certainly want to thank all of those involved in recording and the, uh, the service and the music and, and all of this that goes on behind this ministry for uh, producing it and sending it out, for reaching out to those around you with the love of God during these very difficult times. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you. And that your faces be set like flints as you live and die for him who lived and died for you. Would you bow your heads as we pray? Father, we thank you again this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, that encourages us and strengthens us. Lord, we know, we know that we are redeemed. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus. You've come into our hearts and into our lives and you've changed everything. Lord, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
And while we're here, help us to do your bidding. Help us to do that which you've asked us to do, Lord. Help us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with our neighbors and with our friends and our families. Lord, help us, we pray. Lord, bless this church, O God. Lord, those that come, Lord Jesus, week after week can produce, Lord, Lord, these uh, programs, Lord, and do the music, O God. Bless them today. Lord, use them mightily, O God. Lord, until we can meet again, Lord, in person. Lord, may your word continue to go forth, Lord Jesus. Lord, may it reach out into this community, Lord. Many, 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 Lord, Lord, have slipped away. But I pray, Lord, Lord, during this time that they'll come back, Lord, that they'll hear your calling them, Lord, and come back, Lord Jesus, to your heart. So bless your people today. Be with those that are sick this morning, Lord. Lord, lift them up, O oh God. Strengthen them in their bodies, Lord Jesus. Those that have lost work, Lord, I pray, O oh God, that there be another job, Lord. Someone would call, O oh Lord, Lord, and offer them some work, Lord, that they may provide, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. Help us to continue to trust you and to live for you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Colin's now going to play the doxology. Now worship with him as he plays trusting Jesus. wonderful to be with you again. May God richly bless you. I want to, as a benediction, read from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.